Right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday morning. Hope you guys are having a great day. Let's go ahead and stand. Let's worship together.
see the King of Glory. I see the King of Glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. The whole earth shakes.
For joining us here at the La Mesa Church of Christ. I'm so glad that you could be with us. We are continuing in our discussion of uh, the Gospel of Mark. And as we're getting into a difficult passage today, uh, the death of John the Baptist, uh, there's a phrase that kind of came to mind this idea of that truth hurts, right? Uh, there's an old game show called Truth or Consequences. You probably have not heard of this game show. It was one of the first popular ones that was out there. It was long running. It was hosted actually by Bob Barker before he went on to The Price is Right. Uh, but in this game, contestants were selected from the studio audience, a lot like in Price is Right. Uh, they were brought up on stage where they were asked a question. And they could either tell the truth when that question is asked, or they had to pay the consequences, which was to perform some kind of ridiculous act. So on the show, the question was always some kind of very intentional trivia question. It was usually so off the wall that uh, no one would really be able to answer it completely correctly. And you only had two seconds before Beulah, the buzzer, was sounded. Uh, so, Truth or Consequences became, like I said, one of the first real successful game shows. Um, but Bob Barker, when he was hosting this show, he used to sign off at the end of every episode with this phrase, hoping all your consequences are happy ones. Well, 
that's not always how consequences work, right? In our passage today, we see that not all consequences are happy. In our discussion today, we'll see that John the Baptist, he was just telling the truth about Herod and his incestuous marriage, but the truth hurts. Uh, so the consequences were to have him arrested and he would ultimately be beheaded. You know, things don't always work out the way that we expect, nor uh, do things in life work out the way we had hoped. So even while, you know, we must affirm that Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life, you must also recognize that in that affirmation of the truth, there might be some difficult consequences that come along with that truth. Telling the truth about Jesus may cause you to be ostracized. Telling the truth about Jesus may cause you to be ridiculed or hated, and even in some cases, uh, killed. The truth hurts, and it's not just a song by Lizzo. The truth hurts, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be told. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But for now, let's have the praise team read uh, today's Bible passage, which talks about this very thing. And then they'll pray for us and continue leading us in worship. Uh, today's scripture comes from John 1, 1 through 5 and 14. In the beginning was the one who is called the word. The word was with God and was truly God. From the very beginning, the word was with God. And with this word, God created all things. Nothing was made without the word. Everything that was created received its life from him, and his life gave light to everyone. The light keeps shining in the dark, and darkness has never put it out. The word became a human being and lived here with us. We saw his true glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father. From him the complete gifts of undeserved grace and truth have come down to us. Amen. Lord, we, we come before you now to continue praising you, to continue to worship because of the great things you've done for us. So Lord, help us as we, as we think about the love of Jesus, the love that will never fail, the love that never ends. Lord, we think about your name and how powerful and mighty and wonderful it is. And Lord, we continue to praise you in Christ's name. Amen.
your life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour
everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light. Shine your light and let the whole world sing. We're singing for the glory. Thank you for uh, joining us again. I am glad that you could be a part of this time that we have together this morning. We're continuing in our study of uh, the Gospel of Mark. Um, and as we're kind of kicking things off, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you, know, you can open that to chapter 6, about verse 14 is where we'll start. Uh, and as you're getting there, you know, there's a story that I kind of want to begin with. Today, a few years ago, you know, when the U.S. was a part of this coalition to invade Iraq and dispose of Saddam Hussein, you know, not all Americans were in favor of that action. There were often protesters who would pop up on the news. Uh, there was one man that really stuck out, stood out to me, though. He was pretty angry and yelly. And he was asked why he was there opposing the war. And his answer, you know, more so than his anger and the, the bitterness in his face, what 
his answer stood out more. He said, nothing's worth dying for. And I want to explore that question today. That statement of, is it really nothing that's worth dying for? Uh, because I believe there are some things that are worth dying for. Now, this message is going to be a little different in structure than uh, we normally go with. I'm going to read the passage from Mark like usual, but then I want to introduce the characters and kind of tell the full story, the full drama that's at play here. Because besides the Bible, there are numerous historians that tell us about the characters and the events of this family. Primarily, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus writes about it, but in addition to Josephus, there's also some other historical information that we can gather from the early church father, whose name was Jerome, uh, from the Roman historian Tacticus, and also Cassius Dio. Uh, so let's begin with what Mark tells us. Uh, Mark 6, starting verse 14. Herod Antipatus, the king, stood, or soon heard, about Jesus, because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That is why he can do such miracles. Others say that he is the prophet Elijah. Still others say he is the prophet like the great prophets of the past. When Herod heard about Jesus, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has come back from the dead. For Herod had sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John as a favor to Herodias. She had been his brother's wife, but Herod had married her. John uh, had been telling Herod that it is against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. So Herodias, Herod's new wife, bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But without Herod's approval, she was powerless, for Herod, uh, for Herod respected John. And knowing that he was a good and holy man, he protected him. Herod was greatly disturbed whenever he talked with John. But even so, he liked to listen to him. So, so what's the background here? That's what I want us to first examine. Let's first examine the characters. Now this story has been the subject of hundreds of works of art over the centuries. Um, you know, there is one particular painting where we see John the Baptist. Uh, he is pointing his finger at Herod as he sits upon his throne, and Herod can't even make eye contact with him. The two women are Herodias and her daughter. And I want us to kind of focus in on these four people. Let me introduce you first to Herod Antipatus. Antipatus. Uh, he was an arrogant ruler. The name Herod, uh, it almost had become kind of a, a family name, but it really what Herod means is heroic, but there weren't really any real heroes in this family. And it can be kind of confusing because there are at least eight Roman rulers that use this name Herod. There was, uh, this though was Herus, Herod Antipater, whose nickname was Antipates. He was one of the sons, uh, the one who was referred to as Herod the Great. Now Herod the Great was the ruler that the wise men back in the nativity story, he was the one uh, that he went to when they came asking, where is this king of the Jews who was born today. This Herod, Herod the Great, he was a great builder. That's what he was known for. But he also had a great capacity for hatred and violence. Uh, he attempted to kill the Messiah by ordering all the male toddlers and babies in Bethlehem to be sl uh, slaughtered. Herod the Great was filled also with um, not just paranoia from the community, but he also had this paranoia from within his own family. He was jealous, and that paranoia and jealousy led him to order the death of several of his wives, 
and several of his own children, particularly his sons. There was a kind of a, a joke or a saying that the Jewish rabbis had when referring to Herod. They said, Herod's pig is safer than Herod's sons. Uh, Herod was a great ruler in his own mind, but he actually was plotting the murder of his son Antipatus. But before he could, Herod the Great died from what we would now know to be uh, chronic kidney disease and also gangrene that was brought on by gonorrhea. So very painful, miserable way to die. Uh, Antipatus was named, after his father's death, he was named the ruler of four small areas, which are called the Tetrarch. But Herod always wanted to be more than the Tetrarch. He wanted to be called king. So in an effort to be more of a king, Antipatus married an Arabian princess, uh, the daughter of King Aretas IV. He married her for this royal connection. But this isn't the wife that we see in this story with John the Baptist. So let me introduce you to that wife, Herodias. And she's what we would refer to as a, a wicked woman. Herodias is the Jezebel of the New Testament. Jezebel in the Old Testament wanted the head of the prophet Elijah, but wasn't successful, where Herodias, the granddaughter of Herod the Great, uh, she um, visited Rome. While in Rome, she spent some time with her uncle Philip, uh, the half-brother of Antipatus. Now Philip, he wasn't into politics. Uh, he was just a, a wealthy Roman businessman. But Herodias, we're told by the historian Josephus, that she seduced this much older uncle of hers, uh, Philip, and they were married. Now you fast forward a couple of years and Herod Antipatus, he was growing tired of his uh, life in Israel and he was growing tired of his Arabian princess wife. So he went to go visit his brother, uh, Philip, in Rome. Now, by this point, Herodias had gotten kind of tired of her own husband. So she decided that she would seduce Antipatus, her brother-in-law, who was also her uncle. Now, this is a scandal that is far beyond what we even see on the Kardashians, right? But Antipatus and Herodias... They got together, they eloped and went back to Galilee, and Antipatus' Arabian princess wife had gotten word about the scandal, so before her husband could even come home and uh, rid himself of her, she went back to her father. She told her father everything that was, had happened, but they never divorced. She just packed up and ran home to daddy, who, by the way, vowed to exact revenge on his two-timing son-in-law. Uh, but there's another character in this twisted story, a, a sadder character. Let me introduce you to Salome. Salome is the victimized daughter of Herodias. She was the daughter of Herodias and Philip. Now she's not named in the Bible, uh, but Josephus tells us that her name was Salome. And here's the really sad thing about Salome. The word used to describe her here in Mark indicates that she was a very young teen or maybe even a preteen. It is the word uh, used to describe a young girl who was not yet of marrying age. And girls back then, they married at like 13 to 16 years old. This is the same word that was used to describe the daughter of Jairus just a few um, chapters back or a chapter back. And we know that she was 12 years old. But Salome's wicked mother just used her as a pawn to get to John the Baptist. And then we finally get to 
the good guy in this story, John, God's faithful prophet, John the Baptist. He's the cousin of Jesus. He's six months-ish older than Jesus is. Like Samson, John had taken a Nazarite vow. I don't think the uh, pictures really capture that as much as they should have. Uh, those who were Nazarites never shaved. They never cut their hair. Uh, so he would have been a lot more woolly in a lot of ways. Uh, he ate locusts and wild honey. He wore a camel's hair garment uh, made by Camel Klein. Uh, he had gotten to baptize Jesus even though he felt unworthy to do so. And when they asked John if he was the Messiah, because he was a pretty good candidate, when they asked if he was the Messiah, he denied it. John's job was to introduce Jesus and then to move off the scene. In John chapter 3 verse 30, John said this about Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. But now we find John in the middle of this mess with Herod and Herodias and you see this, this preacher had publicly preached that it was both illegal and immoral for Herod to be sleeping with his niece and sister-in-law. Pretty good thing to condemn, uh, especially since she was still married to Philip and Herod was still married to his Arabian wife. But this public disgrace infuriated Herodias. She demanded that Herod kill him. And can't you just hear her? Can't you just hear the, maybe, the frustrated whine in her voice to Herod? You've got to do something to shut that smelly preacher up. Kill her, or I'm going back to Rome. But Herod recognized that John was a man of God. So to make his wife happy, he arrested John, he put him in jail, and just wanted to forget about him. And we know from Josephus that John was imprisoned in this desert fortress, which was near Jericho. So those are the, the characters. Now let's get into this, this story, this twisted tale. And there's kind of two scenes at play here. This first scene, this ugly scene, is at a birthday party. It was the birthday of Herod Antipatus. He invited all these special guests from all over the territory to his birthday party. And Herodias, she saw this as an opportunity to get everything that she wanted. So she hatched this wicked plan. She knew that as this birthday party went on, the wine would be flowing and Herod would uh, be getting more and more intoxicated. And she knew that her husband had a weakness for all the dancing girls. So she coached. This mother coached her young daughter, who's possibly 12 years old, to perform this sensual, seductive dance for her stepfather. The Bible tells us in verse 22 of chapter 6 Mark, When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. But here's the thing. He didn't have a kingdom to give away. He didn't have a kingdom to give her. He was uh, just a man who wanted to be king. He was only a, a providential ruler over four districts. So he's just kind of bragging, you know, the wine's flowing. He's been excited in this weird way. And he's just bragging in front of his dinner guests. And Salome, after this promise is made, she runs back to her mother and says, Mother, what should I ask for? She was probably thinking, you know, Salome was probably thinking, maybe I can have a new horse or some chariots or an outfit or some jewelry or who knows, anything else. But then her wicked mother, I can just hear her kind of cackling with glee, said, Tell him you want the head of the Baptist preacher. 
John. And he wanted it delivered on a serving tray. And then we're told in verse 25, at once the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And I'm sure in that moment, Herod sobered up quickly. He was in this quandary. He knew that John was a man of God. He was pretty sure that John was more than just a preacher, that he was probably a prophet. He knew that there was going to be real consequences for doing this horrible thing. But he had made an oath. And he had made this oath in front of all of his guests. I'm sure he tried to negotiate with Salome. Wouldn't you rather have something else, anything else? Perhaps some horses or chariots or clothes or jewelry or your own house. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. But please, anything but the head of this man of God. I can just imagine Salome stomping her feet. Because all she wanted to do was to please her mother. So she said, I want his head on a platter. And I want it now. Herod had made an oath in front of all of his guests. He would lose face if he didn't keep his promise. So he decided it was better for John, this man of God, this prophet, to lose his head and for him to lose face in front of his guests. And then we see this shift in the scene to the dungeon. The first prophet, John, the first prophet these people had heard from in hundreds of years was sitting in a dungeon, chained to a wall. And he must have heard the soldiers approaching. He must have wondered, well, what's happening now? What's going on? But when he hears the sword, he knew exactly what was about to go on. He knew that his time was up. And I wonder what went through his mind as they pinned his head to the ground. And as he heard the sword draw and whoosh through the air, I wonder if he thought back, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Verse 27, Mark. So he, Herod, immediately sent the executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went beheaded John in the prison, and brought his head back on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came, and they took his body and laid it in a tomb. As I mentioned, this story has been the subject of countless artists over the years. One of the most famous, though, or maybe it's one of the most famous to me, I should say that probably, is by a rather unfamous artist. His name is Honorio Malari. In 1680, he completed a piece which we can see Herod standing beside Herodias and staring at her daughter. And I think the artist kind of captures the youth and the... the the spoiled innocence of this young girl. Jerome writes that Herodias' hatred toward John was so intense that she pulled out John's tongue and pierced it with a large sewing needle. It was like her saying, now let me hear you speak against me, preacher. But we're going to see that God always has the last word. There's some really crucial life lessons that are in here. Now, I, I had to dig for these pretty deep. This is not the kind of story that as a pastor, I like preaching on. It's not something I enjoy telling these kind of stories, but it's part of the Jesus story. So it's something that we can't deny. So there's some life lessons that I think we can learn from these, this situation and from these characters. Uh, the first one, let's look at Herod. He's the picture of a guilty conscience is a cruel companion. Months later, when Herod heard about 
this Jesus and the miracles that Jesus was doing, he was certain that John the Baptist had come back to life just to haunt him. I am sure that when he was hearing about this Jesus, that he would wake up in the middle of the night, dripping in sweat, hoping that it was just a bad dream about this headless prophet. God has given every person, no matter who you are, where you're from, how much money you have, he has given every single per person a conscience to know what is right and wrong. And the reason we often feel guilty is because we know that we are guilty. We know that we've done something wrong. But here's the thing. You don't have to live with that guilt. You don't have to live with that guilty conscience. In 1 John, we're told, if we confess our sins to him, him being Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So that guilt that we feel is a part of our natural human condition when we do something wrong. We're told here that we don't have to live with that. If we just believe in Jesus, confess our sins to him, and he's going to cleanse it. All that's going to be wiped away. We can live a life free of this guilt. Herod, for example, when Jesus was brought to him after his arrest, Herod could have had the peace of mind. He could have had the forgiveness that he wanted so badly. The guilt he felt could have been subsided if he had just had faith in who Jesus said he was, who he had heard Jesus was. When you give your life to Jesus, all of your sins are forgiven. God has promised that he will put them behind him, that he will remember our sins no more. He promises to separate us from our sins as far as east is from the west. He promised to bury our sins in the depths of the sea. In Isaiah 1, we're told, Though your sins are overwhelmingly scarlet, they can be as white as snow. But Herod didn't do this. He didn't have a real conversation with Jesus. And his guilty conscience ruled much of his life. Let's move on to another life lesson that we get from Herodias. Our hateful attitudes often spill out and hurt those we love. The sad story of Herodias is that her rage at John was like an infectious disease. Her rage didn't just destroy her life, but it destroyed her husband's life, it destroyed her daughter's life, and there's kind of this sad principle in effect our sins not only affect us, our sins um, sometimes even more so affect the people who are around us. It's like the pregnant woman uh, who decides that she's going to ignore all the things that she's heard and read and the doctors have told her about you can't drink and you can't use drugs while you're pregnant. Those substances endanger the life of not just the mother, but also the unborn child. It's like the man who smokes like a chimney in his car when his kids are in the back seat. That selfish act not only affects his own health, but it also affects the health of his family. You never really sin personally. Every sin we commit is like a pebble that's dropped in the pond. Those ripples keep going out and out and out, and they affect the lives of those who are around us. And her sin had destructive consequences on her husband and on her daughter. Remember uh, that scorned wife of Herod who went back to her father, the Arabian king? Two years after Jesus' death, uh, his ex-father-in-law attacked Antipatus. He slaughtered all of Herod's soldiers. He conquered the entire territory. 
And in shame, Antipatus and Herodias fled back to Rome. And Antipas's jealous nephew, uh, Herod Agrippa, the brother of Herodias, had convinced the emperor that Antipatus was guilty of treason. Once again, Kardashian have nothing on this family. So Antipatus, the man who wanted to be king, was stripped of every title he had. He lost all of his property, all of his money, and he was banished to live a life of exile in Gaul, which is not known to be a great place to live. The worst part of the punishment was that Herodias was sent with him. They both had dreams of grandeur, but they died in obscurity, and they were buried in unmarked graves. And then we get to another very sad part of the story with Salome. Because you can be sure your sins will find you out. Moses reminds the Israelites of that. He says in Numbers 32, your sins will find you out. The, Herod, the story of Herod's family, it was fascinating to the Romans. It was kind of like America, how we used to be so captivated by the story of the Roosevelt's or the Kennedy's. And uh, his story records Salome, that her life was filled with tragedy. She moved back to Rome uh, after all this happened. She went to live with her father, Philip. Uh, she had several failed marriages. And according to Cassius Dio, the historian, Salome died tragically when she was vacationing in the Alps. She and her party were crossing a frozen river when the ice cracked. And in the efforts to extract her from the frozen water, a jagged piece of ice cut her head off and it sank to the bottom of the river. Salome's life is a sad reminder of the principle that Paul talks about with the Galatians. Whatever a person sows, that they will also reap. Now she, I understand, she was just a child when all this happened with John. And she can't be blamed solely for what happened. But she did play a part. She could have said no. The guilt and the shame of that night marred the remainder of her short life. And then we get to John. What life lessons can we learn from John? Well, I think there are things that are worth dying for. Remember that protester I mentioned at the beginning of our time who said there's nothing worth dying for? I think he's wrong. And if we look at John, we can see that. I believe one thing that's worth dying for is freedom. We're coming up on Memorial Day here pretty soon. Uh, we enjoy our freedom to worship today because there were countless people who have died fighting to protect that freedom. They realized that freedom isn't free, that it comes at a high cost. In uh, 1863, Abraham Lincoln traveled to Gettysburg. Uh, while there, he participated in this dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery. Uh, Edward Everett gave a two-hour uh, talk about everything that had happened. But then Lincoln, the president, gets up and talks for less than two minutes. But he concluded his famous speech by saying this, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, while it can never forget what they did here. From these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we highly resolve these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. 
freedom is worth dying for. A second thing that we can see, a lesson that we can learn is that our friends and family are worth dying for. John the Baptist was a, a friend of Jesus, but he was also his cousin. And Jesus was also willing to die for his friends. In John 15, it says, uh, Greater love has no man than this, that they, a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus went to the cross to die for us, even though he was sinless. Chuck Colson um, tried to illustrate this power of a friend being willing to die for his friends. He told the story of a group of World War II uh, American soldiers. They were prisoners of war in Japan, and they were sentenced to hard labor in this prison camp. Uh, at the beginning of each day, each soldier was issued a shovel, and they were told to go dig. And they dug all day long. They were required at the end of the day to return their shovel. One evening, 20 prisoners lined up by the guard and the shovels were counted. But on this evening, the guard only counted 19. He turned in rage towards these POWs and he demanded to know which prisoner had kept his shovel. And no one responded. The guard then drew his pistol and said that he is going to shoot five prisoners if the guilty party didn't confess. After a moments of silence, a 19-year-old prisoner stepped forward with his head bowed. The guard pointed a gun at this prisoner's head and fired. As the young man fell dead at the feet of his friends, the guard warned the others, that they must always return their shovels. And as he is yelling at these other prisoners, somebody else recounted, and all 20 were there. He had simply miscounted earlier. And that young soldier died, not because he was guilty of doing something wrong. He died to protect his friends, and he did it without a second thought. We would all love to have friends like that, right? Well, we have one. We have Jesus. And this wasn't a last minute, split second decision. This is something that Jesus planned to do from the foundations uh, of the earth. When time began, he was preparing himself to do this, to lay down his life for you because you're his friend and his family. And then the third thing that I think that we see that's worth dying for is our faith. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But you fast forward a little bit past this. After he was arrested and put in prison, John started having some doubts. In Luke 7, you know, we're told that John sent word to Jesus to ask him, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? You know, in a moment like this, I'm not surprised that this great prophet had a few doubts when he was chained up in this tiny cell. It would have been like putting an eagle in a birdcage, right? Or putting an orca in a little swimming pool. John began to have some doubts and some frustrations as he sat there. And Jesus sent word back to John, to tell him that scripture is being fulfilled, that miracles are being done, and lives were being changed. If Jesus had only been a man, I think he probably would have rebuked John for doubting him. But on this day, Jesus said the best thing that he could about John. Jesus said that John was more than a prophet. He said that, among men born of women, which I think includes most of us, there are none greater than John. Jesus is saying that of all the people in the Old Testament, all the legends and all the kings, that John was the greatest. That John was greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than David. 
And then Jesus said, There is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. John stood up for truth, and he ended up dying for his faith. Freedom, family, and faith. These are at least three things that are worth dying for. Uh, Warren Wiersbe tells a story uh, from China during the communist purge during uh, Mao's time in power in 1949. Churches were closed. Christians were rounded up. They were arrested and executed. Wiersbe tells a story of a small group of Christians who even after knowing all of this was happening, they continued to meet in private. And then suddenly, as they're meeting, as they're praying, the door comes flying open. And these three communist soldiers are standing there with their weapons drawn. And they ordered all the Christians to line up against the wall. The soldier said, if you're not a believer, you are free to leave. Now some of the people left. But a group of these faithful Jesus followers, they stood there with their foreheads to the wall, hand in hand, praying, waiting to die. And when these less committed people had left the room, the soldiers lowered their weapons and said, we are also believers. We wanted to find a group of Christians who are willing to die for their faith. Can we join you? So here's a a rhetorical question that we'll close with today. Would you be willing to die for your faith? I have a more practical one though, one that is much more in need of answering right now. Are you willing to live for your faith seven days a week, 24 hours a day? Let's pray. Father God, I hope that we can all answer yes. It's my prayer that we will have the courage and the faith and the love that we need to have to answer yes to that question. And we ask for your help to help us to live the way that we need to in this world as your children, as reflections of you. Help us to live as reflections of your light. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.